everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Anu Asnani. Um, I am an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Utah, and I am presenting today uh, in my capacity as also a licensed clinical psychologist and a researcher who has had the pleasure of working with several communities here in Salt Lake City um, over the past year on mental health needs. Um, I am presenting today and my uh, student, Karen Kaur, uh, has been very involved in this work as well. She will be uh, with us for the question and answer session as well to answer any questions that come up um, from this uh, presentation today. So we're going to be talking about the impact of COVID-19, um, specifically in terms of the emotional well-being um, of diverse communities, um, many of whom, which of whom are women, um, but certainly not everyone uh, identifies as women as, an, as a woman across these um, communities. But we thought that it was an important uh, and timely addition to what's being discussed today uh, in today's series of talks. Um, so let's get into kind of describing what it is that we. Uh, did and why we did it. So, you know, we know that there's a lot of health disparities in general, uh, but there is a lot of mental health disparities uh, in terms of diagnosis, treatment options, access, and education in, in diverse cultural and racial ethnic minority groups, both in Utah, but in general across the country. Um, so uh, health disparities don't exist in a vacuum. They exist uh, due to many other factors that are ongoing on, you know, socio-political factors like poverty discrimination and language barriers um, and lack of culturally competent mental health providers. Um, and then certainly when you have these ongoing current kind of uh, phenomena, those further impact and compound the mental health disparities that already exist. So things such as the COVID-19 crisis crisis has accentuated um, uh, really the, these disparities in the mental health domain due to disproportionate rates of COVID-19 infection in um, culturally and racially, ethnically diverse communities, uh, significant isolation uh, and deviation from community-oriented activities, which are really central to a lot of these communities. Um, and so that that was kind of the context in which, uh, you know, we had started doing this mental health work um, and mental health outreach work with communities in Utah prior to the pandemic starting um, and certainly it became very clear that uh, understanding what COVID-19 was doing was going to be really important to our work. Um, so this is, I'm going to present a little bit on a study that just wrapped up actually just about two weeks ago. It was a one-year pilot study um, that was funded by our uh, U University of Utah CCTS um, which received funding from uh, NIH's NCATS um, and um, my, my team and I received this funding to really understand what was going on for our communities. Um, and we partnered with this excellent community organization called Community Faces of Utah, um, whom several, several folks have partnered with to better understand the mental health needs in the communities here in Salt Lake City. And for those who don't know, the CFU is made up of five different partner organizations who serve different um, communities, the Best of Africa organization serving African immigrants and refugees, Calvary Baptist Church, uh, which primarily serves African Americans, though others as well who attend that church, Hispanic Healthcare Task Force, um, who my co-PI for this um, study, Dr. Ana Sanchez Burkhead, is the president of um, National Tongan American Society of Pacific Islanders and the Urban Indian Center, um, who's, which uh, serves American Indians and Alaskan Natives. Um, and so we had two kind of phases uh, that we had come up with, again, prior to the pandemic coming on, and then we uh, quickly pivoted and incorporated understanding what the pandemic was doing to mental health. But in phase one, which happened right as the pandemic was starting last summer, was to do these focus groups, which we ended up doing virtually instead of in person due to the pandemic, um, but still were able to meet basically with all five communities. We had about 48 people across the five communities, so eight to 10 in each community, to ask about mental health definitions, priority areas, barriers, and impact. And then we followed this up with this phase two data collection of quantitative survey of community members, 61 um, uh, community members. And then we also extended to providers, individuals who identify as providing mental health, emotional health support in these communities. Um, and, uh, you know, t in terms of the same, we got the survey of the same topics and the impact of COVID-19 on their own and others' well-being and stress. And we wanted to get a sense. And really the long-term goal of this work and this pilot grant was to try to bring resources both directly to communities and to their providers. Um, so whether those were community health workers, 
CHWs, peer supports, life coaches, spiritual advisors, um, and to try to figure out together how we can manage mental health concerns, particularly those stemming from COVID-19. So what did we find? Let me uh, talk a little bit about what we found in phase one focus group findings in, in each of the communities. So for the Best of Africa group, uh, you know, what really came up as the downsides of COVID-19 are some, some ones that we've seen in other communities, financial concerns, a lot of anxiety about the uncertainty about what it means to get the disease, not being able to physically touch and hug other people and being restricted from doing that. Um, uh, the Calvary Baptist Church mentioned some very logistical things that happen as a due, due to the pandemic, like losing their actual church therapist, the really big impact on seniors, greater uh, increase of senior depression because they're isolated, lack of socialization, lack of being able to come to church. The Hispanic Healthcare Task Force also talked about similar themes of occupational and financial concerns, anxiety, and a lot of misinformation concerns um, that would really um, throw things off from an emotional standpoint. And then the National Tongan American Society of Pacific Pacific Islanders talked about, you know, losing family to the virus. And so a lot of grief in that community, a lot of anxiety over the family getting COVID, as we saw in the others. And the Urban Indian Center talked a lot about feeling lonely, fear and anxiety, feelings of uncertainty, and not being able to touch others. So we see some common themes across the groups. One important thing I want to mention is that our community leaders who we work closely with to both recruit uh, and then uh, deliver these focus groups, they were the facilitators of these focus groups, um, asked us to ask about pros. What are some of the advantages or silver linings of the COVID-19 crisis, which we hadn't thought to ask. And so I thought that was really interesting. And Best of Africa group talked about that they actually were getting more time with their family, time to work on their own mental health and self-care. Um, and we saw this as a theme. The Calvary Baptist Church said the same, that we're, we're being forced to learn some healthy coping mechanisms, go back to writing, go back to praying. The Hispanic Healthcare Task Force did not note any specific pros, um, but we saw again with the Pacific Islander community, family self-improvement, learning more about health and resources, and the Urban Indian Center talked about a lot about coming into finding ways to cope, more time to learn new things, people being more considerate and caring and meditation and things like that. So very interesting to see the pros that not everything is bad about it. When we go into the survey, we have bigger numbers here. Um, we we um, uh, were able to see, you know, just ask how much has COVID-19 affected your emotional health? And we, we see this, that the vast majority, are, as expected, are saying a little to a lot. Um, uh, just one caveat about our Urban Indian Center, we did not get many community members um, to do the survey portion as opposed to the focus groups. So this is only two people, 100% of two people, but the rest were all about 14 uh, to 15, I think there were 15 community members from each. So just to give you a sense of the ends that we're looking at here. We also asked them in what ways has COVID-19 caused you emotional stress? Uh, the most common being being socially distant from others, feeling socially isolated, not having those community or religious events. And then about a half reported feelings of those uncertainties. So some of that confirmation from the focus groups and that job loss and financial hardship, a little less, you'd see it more in certain communities, but as a whole, it was about a third of the sample. Um, and how much now asking the providers, how about for you guys, how much has the COVID-19 um, pandemic affected your emotional health? 90% um, in the best of Africa, and then about half in in the Hispanic and Pacific Islander groups. Um, and we also actually surveyed an additional 31 just community health workers affiliated with the Utah Department of Health. And that there, and a huge number of them said that they were really being affected by COVID-19 in their own emotional health as providers. So where do we go from here? As I finish up um, today, you know, thinking about uh, what is what is going to be the the next steps when we think about COVID nineteen is going to continue. Emotional health issues uh, preceded the pandemic and will continue after the pandemic, but they're certainly compounded and certainly um, exacerbated by this pandemic. Um, so we actually just put in a grant to PCORI, uh, the whole team as a community research team. We applied for a significantly larger amount of money um, this spring to provide training and support. Uh, now we're thinking specifically to our community health workers who themselves are feeling quite stressed by the pandemic on managing the emotional toll of COVID-19 in our communities. So this will include some direct provision of resources skills. We're going to be doing some comparing two different trainings of evidence-based strategies for managing emotional and social stress of COVID-19. Um, uh, and it will also kind of take this two-level 
uh, of analysis, two, two levels of analysis at the provider and participant level. So we're training CHWs um, uh, who will be able to do this work, and then we're, we're monitoring what happens to the patients, i.e. the community members that they're treating. Um, you know, so how do these mental health strategies impact adherence to COVID-19 public health guidelines if people are feeling more emotionally um, kind of equipped are they able to follow the guidelines um, to keep themselves and their families safe? How does it impact provider burnout and provider efficacy or feelings of effectiveness working with these communities? And so for this work, we're partnering with the Utah Department of Health to provide the training. Um, and we're also doing some other work, just not even outside of the study, we're trying to partner and provide even before this study gets funded of how we can um, bolster some of their mental health training and mental health supports for the communities. Um, and then a big part, uh, which I just wanna make a plug for, so also important when we're doing community-based uh, participatory research, community-based work, is going back to the communities. We promised that in our pilot grant, and it's already in motion. We have a program set up with all five communities to go back and tell them what we found from our, our focus group and survey data, what we plan to do, and what do they think about it, and get their input, the community's direct input on whether the approach is useful, helpful, um, so that we can continue to provide services that are most helpful um, for what the community is actually saying that the communities are actually saying that they need. So I just wanted to say thank you. We're happy to answer questions that come up. And if we don't get to any in, uh, questions that you had in the Q&A that come up later, that's our contact information there. But a huge thank you to our CFU family for which we can't do any of this research without them. So Ana Sanchez Burkhead, my co-PI on this particular pilot grant. And then our community faces of Utah leaders, Valentine Mukundende, Edwin Napia, Fahina Pasi, Jeanette Valalta, and Darina Lee from the five different CFU communities. Um, my lab, uh, the treatment mechanisms community Community Empowerment and Technology Innovations Lab at the University of Utah. So particularly my students, Manny Gutierrez-Chavez, Tracy Takana, and Ifra Majid, who have been a really uh, instrumental with Karen uh, in being able to do this work. And Karen and I are very, very thankful for that. Um, and then our uh, the col uh, community collaborative engagement team um, that connected us with CFU, so Louisa Stark and Heather Brown in particular. So happy to answer any questions that you have, and thank you for your attention today.